Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. It's great to see a ton of returning guests showing up here in the chat, as well as a few first timers and folks from, of course, Colorado, but of course, across the states as well, too, including Montana and Minnesota. I see some folks who are on the road tuning in. They're so happy to have you and welcome and joining us tonight for the final episode in our series on wolves in Colorado, the science and stories. I'm Kristen Uhlenbrock and I work at the Institute for Science and Policy, a project of the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And I have feel honored to be your co-host through this series. I have learned so much myself as well. So thank you for joining us tonight. Um, we would like to take a moment before we proceed to acknowledge the gratitude towards the many indigenous nations who call this land their homelands. So I wanna acknowledge that myself and our guests tonight reside on the traditional lands of 48 Native American tribes who now live throughout the American Southwest, Great Plains and the Rocky Mountains, including the Crow, the Blackfeet, the Southern Ute and the Ute Mountain Ute tribe, the Arapaho, the Cheyenne, the Apanche, the Comanche, and the Shoshone tribes, among many others. May we proceed with the spirit of respect and generosity that these nations have displayed. I also want to give a few housekeeping items just so everyone gets a little oriented tonight. We do have an audience here on Zoom, which many of you are already chiming in in the chat. Um, if you've joined us on Zoom, we want to see your questions. Um, we incorporate those as we go along. And that chat feature where you're letting us know where you tune in from and you're watching from, same place to put your questions. Um, we've got eyes on those and we'll hopefully incorporate many throughout the discussion this evening. Uh, hello on Facebook Live if you're joining us over there and watching on Facebook. Feel free to use the comment feature to ask your questions. We do see those as well. and We love to see them and incorporate them into the discussion. And I'd love to give the disclaimer that no one likes to see, but we have to have. We will not get to all of your great questions tonight, um, but we do see them and we try to incorporate as many as we can into our discussion. Um, we have past recordings. Um, as you may have heard, this is episode five out of five. So if you've missed any of the previous four and you want to do kind of a, a binge after this, um, we have all recordings available on the Institute website. We also have written recaps if watching videos isn't your thing. Um, Nicole's going to drop in a quick link to that here in the chat and we'll share it at the end as well. I also want to draw your attention to the fact that we have a number of written perspective pieces that take it beyond the guests that we have live during the series. And these perspective pieces are meant to just bring in additional voices to the conversation and provide a different perspectives. Uh, we have articles focused on biases and cultural, or cultural consequences and conservation. That's a a little bit of tongue twister there. We have articles on lessons on past reintroductions. And then John and I co-authored one on the idea that wolves spark passion, but is there common ground? And that was just kind of a framing piece for this whole series. And so we posted that one a little over a month ago. So tonight, as Nicole mentioned, we are going to be talking about the experience of actually living with wolves. It's been 80 years since wolves have been in Colorado. Of course, this is beyond the most recent couple of sightings and radio collar pings that we've had in Northwest Colorado earlier this year. And so tonight, we're going to be hearing from guests that have experienced living with wolves in other parts of the region. They're going to be able to speak to values and concerns and trade-offs in a way that few others can that have joined us on this series. And so at the Institute, we really focus on having civil, productive dialogue and conversations on policy issues that involve science. And with that, our co-host in the series and partner, the Center for Collaborative Conservation, has a very similar mission and perspective, and that we really value the community perspectives in these conversations that people bring um, to these really challenging problems. So we hope you found this entire series very enjoyable and informative, and we're so grateful for you having joined us, and hopefully this was a really great journey for you as it was for me. So I want to acknowledge our partners in this series. It's the CSU Warner College of Natural Resources, the Center for Collaborative Conservation at CSU, the Center for Human Carnivore Coexistence, as well as CSU Extension. A huge thank you to all those CSU colleagues for helping us put this together. And let me welcome and bring my co-host into this conversation, John Sanderson. John is the director at the Center for Collaborative Conservation at CSU. So good evening, John. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Kristen. Thank you so very much for that great intro. And thanks to all of you who have tuned in tonight and special uh, thanks to our guests as well. As Kristen mentioned, I'm the director of the Center for Collaborative Conservation where we support people and organizations 
working together to solve complex conservation challenges. As I mentioned last week, we're not talking about forests and wildfire tonight, but for those of us in Colorado, it's something on our mind and it certainly represents a complex conservation challenge. And so just before going any farther, I'd like to mention that in our thoughts tonight are the many people who, as we speak, are being impacted by fires in Colorado. And then I'd also like to express our gratitude for the hard work of the many people who have been responding to our fires during the past couple of months. And tonight's topic, as you know, is wolves, another complex conservation challenge. And throughout this series, we've been particularly focused on a question that's on this fall's ballot known as Proposition 114, that if passed would direct Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission to develop a plan to restore and manage gray wolves by December 31st, 2023. For those of you who have participated in this series, you've seen that uh, we aren't telling our uh, listeners how to vote, but we do hope that this helps you make an informed decision. One quick request, uh, you will be getting a survey, a post series survey in your email after this is all wrapped up. And uh, we urge you to fill this out. This will help us understand um, what, what you uh, saw in this series and and uh, what you thought was particularly helpful and, and maybe not so helpful. Uh, and it'll also help us to deliver these events in the future as well. Um, and, and lastly, um, but importantly, by participating in the survey, you're also gonna be participating in scientific efforts to understand the complexities that often surround these contentious natural resource issues. And then like Kristen, I wanna just extend uh, several thanks uh, uh, and especially to express my appreciation to the hundreds of people who have joined us, us during this series. Uh, my friends at the Institute for Science and Policy and the Denver Museum of Nature and Science have been a real joy to work with. I wouldn't be doing this from the Center for Collaborative Conservation without uh, close support and a wonderful uh, wonderful teamwork from the Warner College of Natural Resources, the Center for Human Carnivore Coexistence, and CSU Extension. And finally, my engagement in this series would not be possible without the generosity of Ed Warner, who is a supporter of both the Denver Museum of Nature and Science and the Warner College of Natural Resources. So thank you, Ed, and thank you all. So now I'd like to introduce our guests. I feel really honored to welcome these guests. Uh, one of them actually works on the staff of my organization. So we've known each other for a while, but uh, both Denny and Shane, I've only gotten to know in the past year or even in the past month. And it's just been a real treat to get to know them all. Shane Doyle is a member of the Apsaloka tribe, also known as the Crow tribe. Shane grew up in Crow Agency in Southern Montana, which coincidentally is just one town south of where my mother was born and raised. Shane currently lives in Bozeman. He's a singer of Northern Plains tribal style of music uh, and has been for 30 years. He holds a doctorate in curriculum and instruction from Montana State University. Dr. Doyle is now a full-time educational and cultural consultant designing American Indian curriculum for many entities, including Montana Public Schools, the National Park Service, and the Museum of the Rockies. Shane also serves on many boards and committees, including the Extreme History Project, Hopa Mountain, and the Governor's Parks and Focus Committee. He is a board member of Mountain Journal, where he has published a wonderful essay on his search to uncover the deep connections between the Absaroka and Beartooth Mountains along the eastern flank of Yellowstone National Park, the relationship between that land and the Absaloka people. It's a wonderful piece. Um, Thank you. I, uh, uh, we will post so a link to it in the chat and you can check it out for yourself. Um, Shane and his wife, Megan, have five beautiful children who, with guidance from a group of local elders, created the Native American Children's Toy Company, which I also encourage you to check out. Our second guest is Denny Iverson, who I met at a conference back in March earlier this year, just prior to the uh, lockdown, the COVID-19 lockdown. Denny is a rancher and logger in the Blackfoot Valley of Western Montana. 
He's a native of Minnesota who followed his parents to Montana in 1975 to run the ranch in Potomac, Montana. Then he still ranches with his brother and now the next generation from both sides of the family are coming back home to roost, which is really wonderful. And Denny told us just a few minutes ago that he just got uh, uh, one of his grandchildren a new horse just today. So that's really great. Denny and his brother have taken a proactive approach to ranching and changing uh, in a changing landscape for years, and they continue to look for ways to adapt. Some 25 years ago, he got involved with a fledgling nonprofit called the Blackfoot Challenge, and, uh, where he has been a board member for more than two decades. The Blackfoot Challenge, incidentally, is highly regarded for its success with conservation that addresses the needs of the entire community. Then he also sits on the board of Five Valleys Land Trust, where he takes an active role in shaping the future of that organization that looks beyond just land protection. And as if that's not enough, Danny recently joined the board of the Heart of the Rockies, leaving his wife wondering if he will ever learn to say no to another opportunity to volunteer. And our last guest, uh, last but not least, is Kim Skylander, who is the Center for Collaborative Conservation's Associate Director, where she focuses primarily on teaching collaborative conservation and running our conservation fellowship program. Kim has a bachelor's in wildlife biology, a master's in environmental studies, and a PhD in natural resources, which have all enabled her to take a real wide variety of jobs over her career. With the US Forest Service, she was a wildlife biologist, public affairs specialist, assistant direct district ranger, tribal government liaison, and wilderness ranger. Later, Kim taught natural resources for eight years at the Salish Kootenai College on the Flathead Indian Reservation in Montana, and also at the University of Idaho. Before coming to the CCC, Kim was the executive director of the Wolf Ridge Environmental Learning Center, a large residential outdoor school in northeastern Montana, I'm sorry, northeastern Minnesota. Kim is particularly interested in how conventional science can be combined with local place-based and traditional knowledge to support conservation action, human connections to land, and environmental education. So welcome all three of you. We are real privileged uh, to have you with us tonight. Um, I'd love to just go right into dialogue with a question to Shane. Shane, we're hoping that you could share with us a little bit about the long history of the Crow people uh, that you have with wolves and how that is embedded deeply in your culture. Well, thank you so much. It's a great honor to be sitting on the panel, first of all, and um, you know, good evening to everyone. That's a great question, John. You know, I think that uh, that relationship predates the actual Crow tribe. You know, I think that um, that relationship goes back, you know, over 13,000 years. <clears throat> and I think one of the things that separates it from the wolf relationships that we see in, in other parts of the world is that the people who lived on this continent did not have domesticated animals. You know, they didn't have uh, walking food supplies out there that they had to protect from wolves. I mean, uh, and that I think that is one major, of course, uh, issue that um, is gonna always come up with wolf introduction uh, in, an, in a society where we have domesticated animals. So I wanna preface the, uh, the relationship on that fact. And going back all those uh, many thousands of years, you know, uh, it's, it's hard to say when, I, well, the Crow tribe tradition has us really kind of starting as our own group of people within about the past thousand years. But again, as I mentioned, that relationship with the wolves goes much further back than that. And I think that the relationship has always been one of very little conflict. And in fact, um, it, they, the relationship was so mutual, mutually agreeable that I think the wolves did not play a big role in the oral tradition of native people, at least Necro people, and others of the Northern Plains as being like the big bad wolf type image that you see, uh, you know, coming out of Europe um, and it's kind of passed here, over here into America. There is no, there's nothing bad about wolves that native people have really ever expressed. Thanks Shane. All right, let's get Denny into this conversation too and then we'll have Kim in here. Um, 
So Denny, I think John mentioned in your bio that you had moved to Montana um, in the 1970s, um, back in a time when there were no wolves. Um, so I'm wondering if you could take a few minutes to share your perspective about how wolves were first came on your radar so many years ago, and and how you know how did you feel at that time? Well, first, thanks for having me. Ed. This is a real pleasure. Um, yeah, you know, I, I have to go back to something Shane talked about um, a little bit about uh, history with uh, his people and wolves. And my dad actually remembers wolves on the landscape in southern Minnesota as a young boy. Um, they were quickly eradicated and, and they retreated to the north of Minnesota. And, but I remember him telling the stories. So, um, but he wasn't always kind in his stories either. He, you know, he wasn't a fan. And, um, and so here in the Blackfoot, I think we had the benefit of, of having grizzly bears on the landscape first. And through the Blackfoot Challenge, we had put together a group of folks, um, mostly uh, uh, stockmen and, and then some biologists that, that were getting together uh, quarterly, sometimes once a month just to deal with grizzly bears. And, you know, we thought we had it all figured out. Um, and we'd worked with a lot of partners to fence out some calving yards to keep the bears out. And we'd cleaned up our old bone yards where we dumped our old dead animals and, and that kind of thing. And so um, we thought we had, we had the grizzly bear thing, we thought pretty well figured out. And then when the wolves started showing up, the emotions got out of, I mean, just crazy. Yeah, amongst that group and of course amongst all our neighbors and um i like to play devil's advocate sometimes um just get a good conversation going and uh in those early meetings about grizzly bears those meetings would, would always end with well what are we going to do about all these elk and you know we were talking we we're meeting to visit about grizzly bears but we would always end with there's too many elk what are we going to do with all these elk and so when the, 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 the wolf came on the scene, I said, well, hold on, guys. You know, if these wolves behave themselves, they might be the best friend we ever had. Um, of course, that didn't, you know, that didn't fly very far. But, uh, but it did open some conversation, I think, uh, around, you know, the ungulates and, and that, you know, maybe there was a place for wolves on the landscape. And we really didn't have a choice. They were moving in from the from the north out of Canada naturally and moving up from the reintroduction down in Yellowstone. So, uh, so we had to kind of come together and, and, you know, we had to, we had to recalibrate a little bit about how we were doing business. And, um, you know, the, the nice thing about the bears is they went to sleep for a little, by, a little while in the wintertime mm. and the wolves didn't. And so <laughs> you know, we had to, we had to deal with them year round. Um, but, and it was an emotional time, you know, it, I think the fear of the unknown was, you know, are we going to be able, are, are we going to have any cows to gather out of the mountains in the fall? Uh, are there, will there be, you know, 90% uh, of the calves coming out of there? Or are there going to be 70% or, you know, we just didn't know. And early on, there were some big wrecks. Um, and, uh, and it was hard to, you know, it was really a hard pill to swallow. Um, and, you know, we all thought, well, it'd sure be a lot easier if these were, wolves weren't on the landscape, but I think the Blackfoot challenge and the, and the folks that I was dealing with and working with very closely accepted pretty quickly that, well, there are going to be wolves on the landscape. So let's figure out how to, how to live with them. And, um, so that, that opened up a lot of, uh, discussion around how can we, what can we do for our producers to, to help them live with with wolves and and i think you know from time to time there's still there's still some depredation um but by and large some of the things that we've implemented have really really helped um and and i can get into some of those later but but it, yeah it was an emotional time it still is um one of my close close neighbors here um has been gathering uh cattle the last month and finding a lot of carcasses and Got, got the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service folks up there and, and our, our wolf biologists with FWP, uh, Montana FWP, and, um, 
and you know they're they're trying to figure out what what what's happened since last year and what's happened is a, a big pack of wolves has moved in there and so that communication um stream that we have with those agencies is very helpful um they they can react real quickly and uh you know he's not he's not going to get all the ammo from from the gun store in town to try and shoot all the wolves. He's it's like, well, we've, we've, we've got an issue now. Let's see what we can do to deal with it. And I think that's different than in the early, early days. Um, and so at any rate, uh, that's kind of where we're, where we've been. And, and I can, you know, I can get into uh, more into some of the tools that we've used um, and some of the attitudes, uh, how some of those attitudes have changed over time in the last, you know, 10, 12 years that they've been on the landscape. Great, thank you, Denny. Uh, we certainly will wanna explore the ways that, that you all have figured out how to live with both grizzly bears and wolves. And you, you didn't mention mountain lions, but I know they're in your landscape as well. Um, Kim, you, um, you surprised me uh, a couple months ago when we were preparing this session and uh, I had no idea uh, that you had spent time in a small town in northern Minnesota where you would see wolves walking down the street in front of your house. Um, can you share with our listeners a little bit about what that experience is like and how that felt and how people in that town um, manage that relationship with wolves or had a relationship with wolves? Sure. And um, good evening, everyone. Thank you, John, for the introduction. And I'm happy to be here with Denny and Shane as well. And Denny, feel free to jump in as a, a past Minnesotan. <laughs> Just real briefly, um, a little bit about, I'm going to tie a bit, of wolves both in northeastern Minnesota and also in Idaho, but I'm going to focus mainly on Minnesota. But Minnesota's wolf legacy is rather unique because Minnesota is the only state in the lower 48 that's actually always had a viable population of gray wolves, although they got down about 400 in the 1950s and 1960s, and they did went on the Endangered Species List Act in 1973. So the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources currently estimates, estimates that there's about 2,655 wolves in Minnesota, and they're listed as threatened in Minnesota and endangered in the rest of the Great Lakes. So I lived up in a small town, Silver Bay. It's on the North Shore of Minnesota in the little arrow in the Northeastern part on Lake Superior. So between the Boundary Waters and Lake Superior, not a lot of agriculture, not a lot of livestock there, but lots of, lots of big deep woods, lots of wolves, lots of prey for, for animals up there. And I saw wolves, I saw about 14 wolves. I lived there about eight years and I saw them hiking on the trails. I saw them biking on the the bike trails, I saw them um, driving and I saw them walking my dog. And my closest encounter was probably in my own neighborhood as John alluded to, is I had some neighbors move up from the, the Twin Cities and they had, there were two really nice plots just down from me and they proceeded to set up deer feeding stations and they were feeding the deer year round and going through about seven tons of feed a year, it is now illegal to do that within the city limits. We were just on the outside of the, just inside the city limits. And I went and talked to them and I said, this, you do realize that this will probably bring in some of our, our predators. And they said, oh, we, you know, we, we like all animals, it's okay. But the rest of us were not so keen on that because pretty soon our local deer population in our neighborhood went from five to about 40, because as you feed the prey, they increase. And as they did that, the predators came in. So. One day I walked out in my front yard and a black bear was walking down the street because it was there after the deer feed. And <clears throat> another day I'd walk out and um, you'd see wolves because they were there after the deer who were by the feeders. And so I, I learned to be cautious when I opened my front door and especially when I took my dog out, I always had him on a leash. And so one day I was walking down the two lane road just to the west of my house and I was surrounded by Superior National Forest and lots of trails. And so we were walking down there and <clears throat> down the road and my dog, who was a German Shepherd, stopped and kind of pressed up against me and kept looking over his shoulder. And I thought he wanted to go home. And I said, no, no, Luke, you know, we're gonna keep going. So I walked a little bit farther and he did the same thing, looked over his shoulder. And I, I looked, happened to look over my shoulder and here is this 
large dark gray wolf paralleling us on the other side of the road, just trotting down the road. And I went, oh, okay. So I, 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 he, when he saw me look at him, he or she stopped. I started walking forward again, the wolf started walking forward. I stopped, the wolf stopped, and I thought, okay, I think well, that's probably enough of that. So I turned around and started to go <laughs> back home. And the wolf just kept going the way it was going and then disappeared off into the trees. So I never felt like I was personally in danger, but I, the neighbors and I got together and talked to the game board and said, can you please talk to our neighbor to stop feeding the deer so we're not bringing these predators into um, our neighborhood as cool as that is to see them. And so um, they did talk to them. It wasn't illegal at the time. They decided to stop feeding in the summer, but kept feeding in, in the winter, so. That's a story to start. <laughs> uh, Shane, I want to um, actually ask you too about your kind of more modern experience, right? You spoke a little bit to kind of the historical context, um, you know, I mean, as it relates to the Crow tribe, yep. but I'm curious too, you know, you have life experience in Montana and I'm curious, mm -hmm. you know, what emotions, what feelings, what changes have you experienced from no wolves to wolves and potentially how does that play into um, well with your relatives? That's a great question, you know, um, and it's interesting that, uh, you know, you asked that because I, you would think that it might be something that would be, you know, really leave a mark with me um, and that would be something, you know, that would be significant in my life. Um, but I, from a, I guess from my perspective growing up on the Crow Indian Reservation and, um, you know, <clears throat> from the relationships I've had over the years with native people here in Montana and elsewhere, um, you know, wolves have not been a real, a very emotional topic for them. Um, you know, bison are much more of a, you know, a concern. Um, and I think that, you know, when the wolves were eliminated and uh, native people were going through such a traumatic time that I don't know if they really actually were cognizant, the buffalo were eliminated as well you know, before the wolves were eliminated. And so um, I think that maybe their, their emotional attachment to the wolf is not as great as um, we see in Western culture, just because of the role that the wolf plays, I think, in, in not only, um, you know, Western culture history and in literature, uh, but also in, you know, the modern day reality on the ground. You know, I, when wolves came back, I, I loved it, you know, but I'm not a rancher or a farmer, but, um, you know, I'm all for it. I mean, bring them all back as far as I'm concerned, you know, bring every animal that was here back, you know, I mean, that's my uh, sentiment. I don't see any reason why we should get rid of animals, you know, um, I'm, but I, I'm pretty sure that uh, growing up in the society that I've grown up in and getting the education that I've received, I know very full well that there are many people that would not agree with that perspective. And I understand that. Um, but, you know, I feel like um, we're now, we have the knowledge, um, we have, uh, you know, the ability, the infrastructure in place, the social infrastructure that we need to uh, negotiate, to come up with solutions, um, you know, to come together as communities to, to make decisions that are gonna be in the best interests of ourselves and future generations. And I think that, you know, we always have to consider the future generations because, you know, if we don't do that, then we're not being mature adults. And I feel like, you know, a lot of times in our society, we're so wrapped up in the present moment um, that we're not, you know, you know taking the more sophisticated approach, which is to look generations down the road, what is the vision that we really wanna achieve here? And to be able to articulate that. And for something like our um, cohabitation with wolves, you know, I feel like, you know, there's been so much of it for so long as Kim alluded to in her own life experiences. Um, and of course, Denny can speak to it, you know, in, in ways that none of us, of, of others can, um, but, I just feel like, um, you know, looking at what's trending or the ballot initiative in Colorado, I feel just the fact that it's even on the ballot, you know, just the fact that we've gotten that far shows that there is some kind of a shift going on in the consciousness, uh, 
possibly in the um, voting electorate. Denny, you mentioned um, a little bit ago um, that you took a couple of very explicit actions to deal with uh, the challenges that the grizzly bears presented. Shane mentioned just now a couple of things uh, that I think are particularly interesting. You know, one is that, and we've talked about this earlier in the series that um, ranchers in Western Colorado might be a, um, a minority of the population, but they are, if anyone's gonna experience a direct impact, it's gonna be ranchers, right? Um, I wonder if you could share a little bit more about um, the tools that you use, the approaches you've used, what you've learned, but then also uh, something I've heard um, from some friends of mine who uh, are cattle producers is that, you know, these things cost money as well. And so that also affects the bottom line. So it's not just a matter of, of um, you know, spending more money to, to get these fixes. But anyway, could you, could you speak to some of the tools and approaches you use and, and how much that has actually cost you and your community and how you've managed that over time? Sure. Um, well, you know, one of the, I'd say one of the best tools we have is our range rider program. And, and that came, um, you know, to us from other, you know, Idaho, I think, and some other areas near Yellowstone Park that were, that were uh, affected earlier uh, with the reintroduction down there. And, um, and so the range rider tool is simply having some boots out on the ground in the summertime. And, um, you know, they don't have to, we, we thought at first we had to have somebody with a wildlife biology degree or something, you know, and, and, and we found out we really didn't. We just, we needed people that, that like to be outdoors, um, that, that maybe like to ride their horse a lot or they like to ride their motorcycle a lot. Um, and we just had to train them a little bit on, you know, what to look for um, as far as, you know, tracks and scat. And, and we actually, um, the, the folks that, that use a motorcycle or something like that can cover a lot of ground in a day. And, and um, the way that tool works is those, those folks are out in the landscape all summer. And it's not like they're spending every day with my cows they might see my cows once a week um, because they're checking my cows and my range and, and, you know, several of my neighbors. Um, and so the, you know, the local gal that does it for us, she does it horseback and, and she puts in way more hours than we pay her for. Um, but she just loves being out there and she has learned, you know, what to look for. Um, but the biggest benefit of that is just the communication um back to me and and my neighbors that have cattle out and out on the landscape um and and just knowing where the wolves are are they near my cows okay well um then she's going to spend a little more time there um you know just checking on the cows and seeing if you know how skittish they are or if they're calm and you know laying around under the shade or if they're they you know seem to be you know more agitated or something like that and then she communicates that information back to me and so I, I at least have a clue what's going on out there because I'm busy haying and irrigating and I don't have, you know, I, and I can't really afford to hire an extra hand just to watch the cows all summer. And, and we get that paid for, you know, through some of our partners, um, some NRCS funding, uh, Defenders of Wildlife early on and still to this day um, are, are great partners in covering some of these costs. Um, I talked a little bit about fencing early on with the calving yards mm -hmm. and, and um, you know, there's some good NRCS um, pro programs to help with that, with that cost um, oftentimes without too much cost to the landowner, but the landowner has to maintain it. Anytime you put up an infrastructure, you have to maintain it. Um, and uh, so, you know, those, and then I'd say, you know, another, another, another tool that's that's working really well in montana is hunting um 
you know, our population got to uh, a point where our local, you know, our state um, legislature said, I think we can start hunting them. And our wolves got a lot smarter and a lot uh, harder to see on the landscape when hunting came on the, on the scene. And, um, and they're much more skittish around people now. Um, early yeah. on, it was, it was super easy to go out and find some wolves. I mean, you just go out and listen and do yep. a little checking out and you could go find them. And when they started getting shot at, they, they shut up, they became much more aloof. And, and I feel like they've, they've, um, there's been less depre depredation. Um, but that's, you know, that's not the main tool. I mean, I think the main tool that we've used is the range riders and some fencing and there's this, this um, fencing called flaggery, and it's just a single wire with, with flags on it. And we'll actually deploy that out in the, in the hills sometimes um, if, uh, let's say, a pack of wolves is denned up. And, and if our range riders are doing a good job, they're, 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 they're cluing into that, you know, where those wolves are hanging out and and if they're staying kind of in one spot, it's pretty good. I pretty good chance they've they've got a den there, and so we've we've employed some flaggery, um, and that that kind of keeps the the wolves from maybe moving toward our cows. Instead, they move away from their cat from the cows, and and uh, and the other thing that we that we do through the range rider program is okay, um, the wolves are here. So let's use this pasture over here at this time of year. And while they're maybe denning in that area, and then when they move on, now we can go to that pasture. And that's what our range riders can, can really help us with uh, is, 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 you know, discovering some of those habits and, and of the wolves and, and what they're, what they're up to out there. Um, and, and I think, you know, uh, and then I, you know, we have a real close relationship with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and with um, our wildlife services here in Montana. And I can't say enough of, enough good about um, the wildlife services program through the USDA. Uh, those folks are really trained well in, you know, we can find a, a carcass that's all there's left is bones. And, and if we alert them to that, they're, they're right there. And they can look at the bite marks on the bones and and so forth and discover what killed that critter and uh, and and you know the way the bite marks are are on it if 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 they they came upon it after it was killed died from natural causes or if they actually took it down a, a good technician can tell that and uh, and so then we can get some compensation um, through our um, our department of ag here and in, in we have a compensation program in montana through our department of ag that our legislature has funded um not everybody gets uh compensated for every animal they lose you got to find it you know for one thing um but but yeah so I, I don't know if that answers your questions you know to the full extent but it's been pretty successful here in montana So Denny's spoken a little bit about, you know, the perspective of a rancher, the interaction with the land, the interaction with animals. Um, all three of you have that experience. So um, Shane, maybe, you know, a lot of your work is around helping other people understand Native American and Indian um, culture, both historically and modern. Um, I wonder if you could just reflect a little bit or maybe share something um, about the intersection of the Native American whether that's the crow or others, um, as it relates to the land and the animals um, and those three together? You know, that's a great question. Um, and uh, again, I kind of always have to refer back to the natural ecosystem as it was mostly, um, you know, unintruded by native or by people. Um, native people did light fires here um, and they lit fires for a number of different reasons. Uh, typically after a big bison kill. Um, and that was probably the main way that they were able to influence the landscape was through fire. Um, you know, and again, 
to regenerate grasses, uh, to clear out brush, um, to clear away uh, animals like predators, like grizzly bears um, after they've hunted. Because after you have a big bison kill, of course, the natural predators want to come. And, uh, you know, native people understood you're not going to uh, eat off a grizzly bear. And so a lot of times they would start fires in the same places. And with, if you continue to light fires uh, over the course of generations, then there's less fuel, of course, to, to start a real hot fire. And um, that was the way, one of the ways that they maintained kind of a balance and that they were able to return to the same hunting grounds again and again, because of course, once you burn that area and the grass turns green, it's gonna attract the ungulates again. The wind is gonna blow the smell of the grass. And along with all of those natural resources, the wolf was seen as integral to all of those things. Um, you know, the wolves, uh, if you watch them, I mean, I guess historically speaking, uh, native people understood that they really weren't a threat to human beings per se. You know, that they, they were not the kind of animals that attacked people. You know, we don't have any kind of oral tradition about that. Mountain lions, on the other hand, you know, uh, there's different uh, sentiments about those big cats. Um, but you see wolf is used consistently in all the Plains Indian vernacular, and it's used interchangeably with uh, terms that we all know of as human terms. Uh, for example, the, the term scout. Um, if you look at uh, the different languages here in Montana, we have many different languages and several from different uh, linguistic language families. So not even a single word in common. Yet, within almost every single tradition, the word scout is the same word that's used for wolf. And um, I found that to be, you know, the case across the board. And um, it's interesting here in Bozeman, where I live, uh, they call them the Bridger Mountains. And, um, you know, they're pretty famous uh, and they're named after Jim Bridger, the famous scout. Um, but the name that all of the native people had for those mountains was the Wolf Mountains. And, um, you know, there's a lot of different reasons why they called them the Wolf Mountains. But one of the primary reasons was because um, they were great for scouting. And, um, you know, when you get up on that ridge line, you can see hundreds, hundreds of square miles, in, you know, from the east or west. And so just the, the, the sensibilities um, that they use embedded within their language and within their traditions had so much respect and reverence for wolves and understanding that, you know, wolves have tremendous skill and ability. You know, they understood the wolves could cover tremendous distances and that they were extremely astute observers, that every single thing that is out there that's possible to hear or smell, they, they heard it and they smelled it. And they understood by their behaviors, this allowed them to be masters of their domain. And so, you know, the wolf shows up frequently throughout uh, Crow tribal tradition. Uh, one of the best ones uh, I can think of off the top of my head is, uh, you know, in the teepee. And um, all of the different poles in the crow teepee represent uh, an animal, either an animal or, you know, sometimes a season, the four seasons. Uh, but the two door poles, as you come into the teepee, the one on the right hand side coming out is a wolf. And, um, you know, the stories are, you know, wolves, uh, if there's a pack of wolves there and they go after something, you know, uh, they're going to get it. And so that's why you want to have that wolf protecting your door, you know, and not that the wolves would turn on us, but just that any kind of a bad spirit or threat that would come into your house, we want to have a wolf there, you know. And so uh, those are some of the things I think that really kind of give us some more insight into this, what I, what I consider was a very fruitful and respectful relationship for many thousands of years. Thank you, Shane. Kim, Shane mentioned uh, that uh, among the Crow people, there, there has not been a fear of that, that the wolves would turn on people. But that is uh, something that's commonly worried about 
Uh, we, we've heard about that uh, in some of our previous episodes. And Dr. Kevin Crooks mentioned in the first episode that contrary to this fear, that in the 20th century, uh, there are no documented um, deaths of people from wild wolves. So we have that data, but I wonder if you could speak a little bit to the gap between data and the actual experience. And, and the, if you could share a little bit more about, you know, the, the, among the, your neighbors in Silver Bay, how did they uh, deal with these concerns about human safety? And then also one thing that, that, uh, that the info sheet says, that these info sheets that CSU has produced, the one on safety, does mention that if wolves are around, it may not be a good idea to let your dog run off leash. So can you speak a little bit to that direct experience you have to um, how people in Northern Minnesota dealt, or felt about both the human safety and, and manage the pet safety? Oh, Kim, you're on mute. Um, Danny talked a little bit about how when the wolves started being hunted that they they were getting pretty scarce and, and hard to see. And in Minnesota, wolves have only been hunted from 2012 to 2014. It's the only time they were off the endangered species list. And they have not been hunted or trapped since then. And even without being hunted or trapped, they're still pretty shy. And I talked to quite a few people that I knew in Minnesota that had lived with the wolves for 20 to 55 years or so. And I said, what are your impressions of them as an animal? And to the person, they said that wolves are pretty shy. We hardly ever see them. We see mm -hmm. tracks or you run into them by accident, which was most of my encounters was by accident, or people have trail cameras that they put up in their properties and they're surprised to know that they have wolves going through every night and they don't ever see them. And so they said that it's, it's actually fairly rare to see the, the wolves going through there. And I have a, a, <laughs> a quick story that a dear friend of mine has a cabin in on the Canadian side of Voyager National Park, just north of Minnesota. And it's a family cabin. You only can get there by boat or, or skis or snowmobile and <clears throat> no phones or anything there. But so she remembers when she was about 16, the neighbor, there were two teenage neighbor boys at the cabin across the bay from her. And there's a bunch of, a lot of howling and wolf commotion going out on the lake on the ice. And these two teenage boys decided to go check it out. So they went out onto the ice and the, the wolves had killed a deer. They like to do chase the deer out on the ice. It's hard for the deer to get going. It's easier for them to kill them. And she said, these two teenage boys just started yelling and waving their hands and running directly at this wolf pack, just screaming and yelling and, and <clears throat> going on. They're unarmed, of course. And they scared the wolves off the deer. They grabbed the deer and they proceeded to haul it back to the cabin and dress it out for themselves. <laughs> so she was, you know, she thought that was pretty gutsy, these two boys running out there and chasing off these these wolves. But uh, so, but they, although we don't have, they didn't have livestock depredation up on the North Shore, there is livestock depredation in Central and Southern Minnesota, but there is pet depredation up there. And <clears throat> so pets, wolves, Wolves, particularly with dogs, um, they've been, the science says they either see them as a threat through their territory and they also may see them actually as food as well. But there was pet, pet depredation up there. As a matter of fact, there was a, um, some wolves at, in Ely, Minnesota, which is about an hour from where I lived on the Boundary Waters, took out 17 dogs in one month. So if you're a pet owner and you know that, and what happens then is that's considered depredation. So a government trapper will come and remove those, those wolves, yeah. it's considered depredation. So if you're a pet owner, um, like, like I was, you just follow common sense, the same thing you would do if you had bears in the area or mountain lions or anything else, you're going to want to make sure you're not feeding your dog outside or leaving um, any kind of garbage or food that might bring wolves in. You want to make sure you're not penning, your, you want to make sure you're not tying your dog out on a lead all night where they can't be supervised and you're going to want to put them in a kennel, uh, something that's pretty secure. You're not going to want to go hiking if wolves are in the area and you know they are and just let them run off leash, which a lot of people do. And unfortunately, that's when the dogs get in trouble. They run into a wolf pack when they're hiking and the wolves will take them out. Um, or you walk, walk your dog on a leash or have make sure they're under control. 
control. So people that live in wolf country just kind of know that. It's just kind of like people that live with grizzly bears or mountain lions or anybody else that mm. you can, um, you know, just be aware of that. Now, if there's a wolf pack in the area, you know, I, I also would not let my young grandchildren out in the yard without supervision just because they are predators after all. Same thing with yep. you know, my, um, my dog. So it's just an awareness and, and being aware and being cautious that if you've seen tracks around and you know they're in the area, that just, just to heighten up your awareness a little bit. Thank you for that, Kim. Yeah, um, we have some thoughts here in the chat that we're gonna try to combine. Um, and I'll start with Denny, but maybe all of you can speak to them. Um, because people are, you know, very much of trying to think about this other states and how would this apply and how would this look in Colorado, right? We, you know, there's this big region here out here, but at the same time, you know, there are differences between regions and between states. Um, in particular, you know, there was a question, you know, specific to Denny, but I'm sure others could speak to maybe some differences between where you're from and, and what you could maybe provide some insight to for Coloradans. Um, one question um, from Marge was specific about the differences in landscapes. And so Montana has some more open grassland, more conifers, um, and where the potential reintroduction would start here in Colorado, there's some concerns about the density of our brush and some of the thick aspen stands that we have. Um, so this is, um, of course, specific to ranching, um, but in general, this could be also tied into the fears of potentially not seeing predators. Um, you know, any any advice on how you would imagine a coexistence in potentially understanding ranching near forestry land um, and that intersection between the two when it comes to predators and the co potential coexistence? Yeah, I can speak to that, um, Kim. That, uh, so our landscape is, is heavily timbered and we yes. do have mm -hmm a lot of brush and we have a lot of um, wetland areas within our our timbered areas um, it's it's a real mosaic of of, of uh, different types of landscapes here in the mountains of western montana and so uh you know i've 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 been fencing and you know i'm i'm walking through an open meadow that's maybe only four or five acres in size and then immediately into a, a creek bottom marshy area that's that's wet and densely uh you know forested with conifers and cedars and brush and you can't see you know 10 yards down the fence line um and that's what our cattle are in and um and so that that creates a challenge um for our range riders uh at times to you know find the cows and and number two find the wolves um, but we, but they usually use the roads. I mean, if there's roads intersecting most everything and, and our range riders use the roads a lot to look for scat and tracks and then, and then start looking for, you know, the different things that we, we want them looking for. Um, so I think our landscape is, is similar to what a lot of the ranchers in Colorado will be experiencing. Um, and the same, same kinds of issues that we've had to deal with, I think they'll be dealing with, um, now, you know, I think out in the Eastern Plains, it's, it's a little different, but there's not as many wolves out there. They are out there. And uh, typically out there, you know, you've, you've got a, a small mountain range um, and then, you know, just big grasslands all the way around it and, you know, and a lot of farming. Um, so here in Western Montana, it's, it's pretty similar, I think, to, to a lot of what the Western uh, Colorado rancher is going gonna, is gonna to be dealing with there, too. I did see... I know you told us not to look at the chats to take our <laughs> attention off, but I did see a question about how big the calving yards were. And, um, you know, we've got them all the way from 10 acres up to 160, 320 acres that we've fenced out, uh, depending on the size of the herd that's being managed on a particular ranch. And we've learned one thing that we've really learned is that we don't have to have eight foot fences to keep wolves or bears out. Neither one yep. of them like electric fence. And so, uh, you know, a four foot fence, um, it works just fine. And that's about less than half the original infrastructure we were putting in. And so, uh, and cows don't like electric fence either. So it keeps the cows in really well too. Um, but yeah. 
You're welcome to look at the chat and answer those. So. <laughs> 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 we, we won't punish you, Denny, for that. Okay. <laughs> Didn't pull your mic. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're actually running out of time. We only have about five minutes left. So we've got a couple questions uh, for, that we'd love all three of you to address briefly. Um, I'll ask the first one. Um, in previous ep episodes, We've talked a lot about the need for stakeholder engagement and processes that allow many voices and perspectives to be heard. And I wonder if each of you could speak briefly to your experience in navigating an issue where collaboration and partnerships were an essential part of the process. I, well, I guess start. I could oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Shane. I just say briefly, um, as long as everybody comes to the table and you've got everybody there and they're interested in making things happen, my experience has been it's very good. Yeah, I'd, I'd say I'd say the same. Um, what was interesting for us, I think, early on was uh, getting our local wildlife biologists to uh, let us ranchers know where the wolves were. Mm -hmm. um, and when when we developed that trust that we weren't going to go out and just kill them all, um, but that we were just interested in where they were so that we could manage, you know, better in the summer, then they were much more forthcoming with with uh, information about, you know, the the known uh, packs and where they were wintering, where they were summering, those kinds of things. So making those partnerships early um, is key. Absolutely key. Denny, uh, Kim, I'll give it to you in just a second here, but a quick follow-up if you were watching the chat, which you're not supposed to be doing. But uh, <laughs> specifically a question for you. Um, when you're in a room and passions are high, what's, give us one tip for lowering the temperature. Oh, man. Um, if, the, if the meeting lasts 10 years, you're, you're golden. Um, it, that, I mean, that's just the key. You know, having a meeting is, I, I hate public meetings. I mean, I just, because of that, you know, but they're so important. We have learned here in the black, but they're so important to have. Just sometimes people just need to let off steam. And, you know, if you're, if, if you're passionate about something, it's going to come out, whether you're, you're belligerent about it or you're, you know, thoughtful or whatever in your, in your speaking. And, and, and in either way, sometimes folks just got to get it off their chest. And yeah. so we hold a lot of, we held a lot of public meetings about this and of course, any other, any other issue that comes up. Um, but, you know, I think just letting people have their say, oftentimes you can't, you can't um, uh, cure what's, what's ailing them emotionally, but you can, you can listen and, and take that into, into you into you know what we as an organization then the blackfoot challenge uh is going to do down the road okay well there's something we hadn't really thought about um and just getting everybody to the table as shane said is key but uh, and and making sure that everybody is at the table no matter what their emotions are right but you, you said usually listen. Can't, yeah you usually can't lower the temperature a whole oh, okay. lot yeah, great. Well, you did say listen, which I think is something we can all do better. Kim, you teach collaborative conservation. You have been teaching it for a long time. What uh, what what core bit of advice do you have us uh, have for us about having? How do we have this dialogue? Well, Shane and Denny are right on. Uh, it, trust is huge. Building trust, having all the stakeholders to the table, whether you agree with them or not, uh, from all different angles, pros and cons, whatever you're looking to, because people need to be listened to. They need to have their values heard. They need to have their concerns heard. Even if you don't agree with each other, if you can listen to the other person and try to understand where they're coming from, this is really key. So best collaborations work are when people are willing to meet each other halfway and say, I disagree with this, but I want to hear your side of the story. I want to understand what, where, where you're coming from is really, really important to big um, Big, big projects like this. And I was on the information education team for the Forest Service with the original Yellowstone wolf reintroduction. And that was not, <laughs> collaboration was not, um, not the prime thing there. There was a lot of 
public meetings and people are not feeling heard, a lot of very strong emotions that would just get riled up in public meetings, as, as you know, Denny kind of alluded to. So I think Colorado is way far ahead of the game by learning from the different states, Montana, Idaho, Minnesota, about what it means to listen to each other, try to come out with things that will work for all parties, or if not, at least understand where other people are coming from and appreciate their values. Well said, wow. Well said. I think I that's teach a, it. You teach it. <laughs> I feel like all of us on here have that perspective. It's just great. Mm -hmm. I've seen it come up too in our audience members. Um, you know what I mean? I just, I think people are getting it too. And I think it, that listening aspect is really just foundation to it because trust, trust can, trust is hard. It's hard to earn. Um, and it's very precious when you do have it. Um, so I think we should probably wrap up, John, what do you think? It's six o'clock. And as we probably alluded to, this goes by so fast. Um, and I loved a, a comment here from one of our guests, Lisa, who's like, even with her Zoom fatigue, she's been looking forward to these sessions every week. Um, you know what I mean? So I want to say thank you to all of our guests tonight and a huge thank you to our audience for for tuning in and for you know listening to us um, try to pull this together. Um, thank you so much for your time. This was a lovely way to spend my evening and I think a beautiful wrap up to our series. Uh, there was a lot of hypothetical talk for Colorado, which you know we, we don't have it quite yet like you all have experienced. And so we really think this was a, a really nice kind of capstone into the webinar series. So thank you all for, for joining us this evening. A huge thank you to John. Um, it's been such a pleasure co-hosting with you. Um, you know, two of us can make this happen. Well, a thank you to all of our partners, which we introduced at the beginning, um, all of our colleagues up at CSU, museum colleagues, institute colleagues, all of our speakers throughout the series. Thank you so much. I think Nicole has or will drop in their uh, links to everything into the chat. Well, you'll see that in your email too. And I just want to give another plug, and encourage you all to fill out that survey. Um, we really appreciate it from our end. Um, and I want to make one more plug, like I did last time, that um, we do have a workshop for those who want to go a little bit more into the historical um, aspect. Um, my colleague at the zoology department in the museum um, has an interesting series to how or not to how, the legend, the myth, and the evolution of wolves and their kin. Um, so that that's going on if you guys want to go learn more about wolves. It'll be starting, I think, on November 2nd. So it'll be post-election um, as well, too. There's like a three-part episode to that. And I would want to say vote. I think we're 12 days out from the election. You know, in Colorado, we get all of our ballots here in the mail. Um, we encourage you, if you've got your ballot, to fill that out and vote. And, and vote however you want on this ballot initiative. We are not telling you how to vote. But hopefully, you found some information helpful from this series to help inform your decision. Um, that's it for me. Thank you so much. John, any final words as well? Just a big thank you to our guests and thank you for all the people who tuned in. Great. All righty. Thank, thank you. you all. Have a Thanks, great guys. evening. Good thank night. you so much. Thank Take you. care, everybody.